Oh, nice. Yeah, ready? Yeah. Good morning. I'm Jesse Levine, Senior Advocacy Officer for Scholars at Risk, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. We are here to discuss the development and implementation of practical protections for academic freedom, building on the powerful work of international actors, including the Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Opinion and Expression and the Right to Education, as well as the recent groundbreaking joint statement on academic freedom led by the French and South African missions and signed on to by more than 70 other states. Before we get started, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Uruguayan, French, Portuguese, and EU missions for truly incredible practical support and partnership. I'll begin by sharing pre-recorded opening remarks by Mr. Amon Gilmore, the European Union Special Rep Representative for Human Rights, then I'll share a few brief remarks and introduce our expert panel. Following their presentations, there will be a brief question and answer period. And finally, closing remarks from Ambassador Alvaro Morzinger Pagani of Uruguay. Amon Gilmore is the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, EU Special Envoy for the Peace Process in Colombia, <laughs> former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade of Ireland, former leader of the Irish Labour Party, and an adjunct professor in the School of Law and Government at Dublin City University. We're honored to have his support and that of his mission, and we welcome his intervention. I'm pleased to co-sponsor this side event on academic freedom. I wish to express my appreciation to scholars at risk for organizing this discussion today and to France and South Africa for their efforts to keep academic freedom on the Human Rights Council agenda. This includes the, the joint statement in the last session of the Council and all EU member states subscribed to that statement. Academic freedom is essential for any healthy democratic society. Without it, critical thinking cannot be cultivated and critical thinking is key to freedom, prosperity, progress and innovation. People need to be able to share and access information in order to develop new ideas and the freedom to research, to teach, to debate and to disseminate is central to the advancement of knowledge. Academic freedom is also key to holding authorities and governments to account. It is essential for protecting and empowering society as a whole. Many human rights rely on academic freedom for their enjoyment and vice versa. This includes the right to education, the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications, freedom of opinion and expression, including the freedom to seek, receive and impart information among others. Yet academic freedom continues to decline across the world. Reports of threats and attacks against the academic community are steadily increasing. Higher education institutions are also confronted with disinformation and information manipulation attempts. We need to work more closely together to stop this disturbing trend. The academic community has the right to fulfil its functions without discrimination of any kind and without fear of repression by any source, with the full protection of international law. Existing international human rights law and standards create obligations for states to respect, protect and promote academic freedom. The European Union is committed to uphold academic freedom both in Europe and globally. Ensuring academic freedom is at the core of all higher education and research policies developed at EU level. And it is also part of our external work in line with the EU Action Plan on Human Rights and Democracy from 2020 to 2024. We work to protect members of the academic community at risk across the world. One of we, the ways we do that is through our human rights defenders mechanism, which has a global reach. In partnership with the Global Campus of Human Rights, we support Afghan scholars and students who had to flee their country after the takeover by the Taliban. With the MSC A4 Ukraine scheme, we provide fellowships for researchers who had to flee Ukraine as a consequence of Russia's war of aggression. We will continue to work with partner countries and organizations, the UN system, higher education institutions, and civil society to uphold academic freedom. I commend the efforts of the Working Group on Academic Freedom in developing the principles 
for implementing the right of academic freedom. This is an extremely important document, which no doubt will enhance the understanding of academic freedom and of its protection under international human rights law. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration and Programme of Action. It is an important moment to focus on how to strengthen the universality, indivisibility and interdependence of human rights and the importance of academic freedom to that effort. I wish you well in your discussion today. We thank Special Representative Gilmore. That was a perfect introduction to this conversation. Uh, I think it's worth noting at the outset how far we've come in recent years. We've emphasized for a long time that academic freedom is fully grounded in and protected by existing human rights law and longstanding norms, including especially the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the right to education, and the right to the benefits of science. Over the past three years, leading international human rights actors, including some of those here with us today, have affirmed that point and given us all a sharper and more complete understanding of what we mean when we say academic freedom. The resources we can now draw from include the 2020 report on academic freedom by the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Opinion and Expression, regional commitments like the ones described by Special Representative Gilmore in the EU, and the Inter-American Commission's Principles on Academic Freedom and University Autonomy, UNESCO's recommendation on science and scientific research, the joint statement on academic freedom drafted under the leadership of the French and South African missions and signed at the previous HRC session by more than 70 states. And finally, the report just released by the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, which reaffirms the crucial connection between academic freedom and the right to education and gives us a way forward. These authorities describe what academic freedom is at an unprecedented level of detail. Just a few of the many crucial points they emphasize are the importance of academic freedom protection for students, the premise that the exercise of academic freedom includes both traditional academic expression in the classroom or lab and expert expression outside campus in public fora, underscoring the scholar's right and duty to engage with the larger society. And the crucial point that academic freedom requires international engagement and exchange, regardless of frontiers. These reports and statements have marked major steps toward effective global protections for academic freedom. But it's important that we not lose sight of the fact that these advancements were not created in a, in a vacuum. Beyond reflecting a deeper and more nuanced understanding of what academic freedom is, these documents are responsive to an on-the-ground increase in threats to academic freedom around the world. According to the most recent Academic Freedom Index, more than half the world's population, over 4 billion people, lives in states where academic freedom has been on, on decl in decline over the past 10 years. In our most recent report, known as Free to Think, Scholars at Risk's monitoring project identified and tracked 391 distinct attacks on higher education in the year ending September 1st, 2022. That's the largest number of attacks we've ever tracked. These include violence and wrongful imprisonment, institutional takeover by state authorities and their allies, and as Special Rapporteur Shahid has noted, increased restrictions on student protest. I would suggest that one of the things standing in the way of us practically addressing the problem is that the world has yet to fully recognize that academic freedom is as important to a free society as an independent judiciary, strong civil society, or a free press. To give just one example that I've cited elsewhere, within the context of the UPR, the number of state recommendations focusing on human rights defenders and journalists number in the thousands. By contrast, there have been fewer than 20 recommendations relating to academic freedom. This illustrates both a challenge and an opportunity. Making academic freedom a practical on the ground reality must be a central part of our understanding of what's required for social and scientific progress and democratic advancement and the realization of the sustainable development goals. Building on the advancements of the past few years, we must develop more and better tools that states, as well as the international, as in international and institutional actors, can use to protect and promote academic freedom. It was with an understanding of these challenges and the complexity of academic freedom that we established a working group of international experts to assess current protections and begin asking questions 
about the real world demands of implementing academic freedom. I'm pleased to note that UN staff, as well as current and former mandate holders, are members of this working group. What came out of that work was the draft principles of implementation of the right to academic freedom. These represent one significant step toward the development of practical protections for academic freedom. One of the purposes of this event is to build on these principles by consulting with states, UN and regional actors, civil society, and institutional partners to develop authoritative guidance for a set of practical tools to assess protections, propose responses, and empower actors at every level to effectively promote and protect academic freedom. A link to the principles was shared in the invitation to this event and is available in the chat for those attending online. It's currently open for comment and I wanna emphasize the importance of your consultation with this process. This is the type of proactive collective partnership that the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education calls for in her recent report and I'm delighted to introduce her now. Farida Shaheed took the office as the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education on August 1st, 2022. She's a sociologist and the Executive Director of Pakistan's leading gender justice organization, Shirkat Ga Women's Resource Center. Widely published and the recipient of several human rights awards, her research and work have been dedicated to promoting and protecting people's rights, in particular marginalized groups such as women, persons of non-binary identities, those living with disabilities, religious and ethnic minorities, and the economically marginalized. Special Rapporteur Shahid, it's an honor to give you the floor. Thank you, and good morning and good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. First, let me thank the organizers for arranging the side event. Because uh, you're I, muted. I am not muted according to me, Sorry. perhaps. Sorry. Let me Can you hear? Yeah, okay. So uh, thank you for organizing this side event. I think it's a very crucial subject. So let me also start by saying that I have always considered the academic freedom, including in the field of science and arts, uh, as key for democratic societies. And it's a position that I hold currently as the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, but I've also emphasized previously as the Special Rapporteur on Culture Rights. Um, you know, to sum it up, I think uh, uh, the previous uh, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression has said uh, very nicely, um, without academic freedom, all societies lose not just an essential element of uh, democratic self-governance, but the capacity for self-reflection, for knowledge generation, and for a constant search for improvement of people's lives and social conditions. And surely this is exactly what the purpose of education should be, because I'm coming from the right to education perspective. Um, we need to also include in this questioning of received wisdoms and understanding as from the past and also as they exist today. We need to be able to move forward. The right to education therefore absolutely necessitates the respect for academic freedom, and when there's insufficient protection of academic freedoms, this, uh, this affects the functioning of the educational system as a whole, from the top to the bottom. And unfortunately, as was mentioned uh, by the representative of the EU and also the presenter in the beginning, there's a worrying increase in the number of violations that are taking place and the mandate is receiving worrying information uh, of violations of academic freedom from many parts of the world. So it's not just in one place, etc. And the violations that take place uh, happen in different forms. And so the academic, uh, the um, academic fr uh, freedoms, um, of course, must encompass the participation of both educators and learners in decision making and policy making as you go forward. What all is this about? And recently, student unions in particular have stressed the shrinking civic space for uh, student engagement in higher education governance and the issues that they have there. This was a submission that was made to the mandate. I'd also like to note there that there have been and continue to be attacks against trade unions uh, of teachers particularly if they raise their uh, voices to defend their own rights to decent and just working conditions 
or they want to raise their voices to participate in the reform ed educational systems. There have been attacks on the autonomy of universities and higher uh, education institutions. There have been attacks against all kinds of actors participating in or those who desire or attempt to participate in academic and scientific debates, which may or may not be within the classroom or the lab. They may be outside in the public. Um, and uh, these kinds of debates are increasingly informing political decisions. But if teachers and educators and academics and scholars are not allowed to participate, that becomes a problem. I think there's a number of less obvious violations also which is, for instance, restricting the freedom of expression and critical thinking in educational settings, despite the fact that critical thinkings and debates are precisely what education should encourage for both educators as well as learners. I also want to stress um, the use of digital technologies in education, which sometimes lead to undue restrictions to academic freedoms, for example, through the surveillance uh, of teachers. So in some institutions of higher education, uh, there are cameras um, and there are a whole bunch of issues there which uh, need to be looked at and unpacked. Teachers should not be reduced to simply conveying information. To me, that is not that their principal role. In fact, more and more people are going to other sources. The teacher is no longer the source of information. You have a multiplicity of sources of, uh, of information. Education really depends on the development of an interactive relationship between uh, those who may be the educators and the learners through discussion and debate. And this is essential for growth. Uh, and teachers must be able to fully deploy their participation within the teaching and education enterprise. Academic uh, freedom, of course, includes the right to teach without any interference, including the right to choose the content and methods of teaching, and the freedom to use or not use any specific technique or technology to help devise also assessments that can gauge learning, not just a memorization of facts for which there are now, as I said, increasingly diverse sources. I think the content of academic freedom needs further development, of course, based on the work of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Uh, which uh, the general comment number 13 and the special rapporteur on freedom of uh, opinion and expression. I also welcome the joint statement uh, on academic freedom of the human, uh, at the Human Rights Council this March uh, by the group of 74 countries. I fully support the process leading to the draft principles for implementing the right uh, of academic freedom, which I think can provide useful guidance to United Nations mechanisms, such as my mandate, but also states and other stakeholders. As we just heard now, I think what is required as we move forward is more authoritative guidelines to be developed uh, together. And I'm particularly happy that these draft principles have adopted a wide approach, considering academic freedom as essential to all levels of education. And I want to emphasize that because some of the concerning information uh, that is reaching our mandate is uh, that this starts at a very early age where certain books, et cetera, or theories, et cetera, are not being allowed to be part of the school curriculum uh, in, without explaining as to exactly why. So academic staff, as well as students, must enjoy academic freedom. I just want to end by stressing principle nine that has been identified, which is that the protection of academic freedom is really a shared responsibility, and it's a shared responsibility of all stakeholders. Therefore, I call upon everybody. We need that discussion. We need wider discussions um, to come to an agreement consensus of what all should be the content uh, of freedom uh, of academic freedom and how this may be played out in different scenarios at different levels etc and finally just to say that i will my next report i i mean in that will be presented in june 2024 at the session of the human rights council next year will be on academic freedom so we will be circulating a questionnaire uh, during the fall, and I do hope that everyone who is here and participating uh, will 
also contribute and also further circulate the questionnaire so that we can get as wide an input as possible from the different perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Special Rapporteur Shahid. Uh, that was, that was uh, an outstanding intervention, truly. Um, our next speaker is Mikhail Mancisidor. He is a doctor in international relations and teaches international law and international human rights law at the University of Dusto, uh, <clears throat> Mondragon University, and the Washington College of Law. From 2004 to 2014, he was director of the UNESCO Center in the Basque Country, where he worked on cultural heritage, education, cultural rights, arts, and science. Since 2012, he's been a member of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And in that role, he has participated in almost 200 dialogues with state members' delegations. He's also previously served as the Rapporteur of the ESCR Committee for the General Co Comment on Science, adopted in 2020. He was awarded the Human Rights Golden Medal by the, by the, the Liga Pro Derechos Humanos. He is a member of the Globernance Institute and the governing board of the Real Sociedad Vascongada de Amigos del País. Professor Mancisidor, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from uh, Spain to, to Geneva and to those uh, taking uh, part from, from, from different uh, places. First uh, of all, uh, I want to, to thank the, the, the organizers of the event for the very, very kind uh, invitation and uh, especially the UO, the European Union mission and the missions of uh, Uruguay, Portugal and France for the, the, the key com commitment with academic freedom. It's for me an uh, honor to take part in such an important panel. Especially taking the, the floor right after the UN Special Rapporteur for the Right to Education, Farida Sahib, has for me a very special personal significance. Since uh, I, didn't run, I did run for, for this uh, position, and I was the, the second to, to Farida uh, Sahib. And um, it, uh, it is uh, uh, being uh, the second uh, after or to, to Farida Sahib, I mean, it's an honor in itself. Uh, I, I did uh, collaborate with her crucial mandate uh, as a special reporter for cultural rights, and uh, uh, I will be more than happy and privileged to have the opportunity to collaborate uh, again in uh, her new mandate that I'm completely sure uh, is going to be uh, again uh, a very successful one. I'm uh, here taking the floor in, in three capacities. Uh, for us, a, a member of the uh, working, uh, the draft team working uh, group uh, on uh, on this uh, principle of academic uh, the freedom, presenting these uh, uh, principles for, 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 for the implementation of the right to academic uh, freedom. Second, as a member of the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural uh, uh, Rights, where we should consider, we should apply and be guided by these principles. And uh, lastly, as uh, a scholar interested in enjoying, exercising, and promoting academic freedom. In the first uh, capacity, as a member of the drafting uh, group, in, in addition to recognize the leading role played by uh, Robert Quinn and the scholars as, at the risk team, I would like to underline the idea that academic freedom is a human right in itself. Or, if you prefer, is a content, a normative content of several human rights, such as a human right to education, of course, to science, freedom of expression, opinion, thought, and others. It is uh, a right for uh, scholars to enjoy, sure, but also for uh, students, whatever their age, and for the benefit of the entire society in a particular uh, uh, country, and uh, even for the benefit of humanity, in so far 
as this right spreads knowledge, science, ideas, uh, solutions, uh, opportunities for every uh, body. It, uh, this right supports and promotes talent, innovation, and uh, science. In a world, this uh, right promotes human development and sustainable development goals. Academic uh, freedom is uh, necessarily connected, is uh, inevitably uh, associated to freedom of expression and thought, to autonomy of uh, society, to individual uh, liberties, uh, and to the, 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 the values of a democratic society. Academic uh, freedom implies for the state not only negative, but also positive obligations to the maximum of their available resources as provided in uh, Article uh, uh, 2 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and uh, Cultural Rights. So, uh, obligation not only to the respect, but also to protect and to fulfill. In addition, remember please Article 15 of uh, this very same uh, covenant uh, uh, when uh, it says that the state's parties in the present covenant recognize the benefits uh, to be derived from the encouragement and development of uh, international uh, contact, contacts and cooperation in the scientific and cultural um, the fields. Uh, that means regardless frontiers, and this is fully applied to applicable to uh, academic uh, freedom. In my second capacity, uh, as, a, as a, a member of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, I can share here and now with, with you the information that uh, this uh, document of uh, principle on, on academic uh, freedom will be presented not only here in this uh, important uh, event, but also it will be uh, presented uh, in September at, uh, at the plenary of uh, our committee. This uh, important document will be discussed uh, among uh, members in order to study uh, in the way in which uh, this uh, document can be helpful for, for us to, to, to better focus our mandate and to better fulfill our uh, duties, especially on the right to education and uh, cultural rights. In the very, uh, in the very same um, uh, vein, I, I encourage the states and uh, civil society organizations to, to base or to, 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 to found in the future the reports on these issues, education and cultural rights, uh, not only to our committees, but uh, to the rest of the treaty bodies and the, 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 the Council uh, itself, uh, with the additional uh, help and inspiration of this uh, uh, document. I'm, uh, I'm uh, sure that this um, uh, report, this document, these principles are here to stay very long and to base our future vision and understanding of academic uh, freedom. In my last uh, capacity as uh, a scholar, I'm uh, committed to uh, spread and promote and, pro and protect and, and disseminate this uh, principle among the, the institutions I work uh, for or with. And I encourage you if you allow me to do so, to do the same. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mancisidor. Uh, this was uh, another outstanding intervention. Um, our final uh, panel member is Hector Uloa, who is the outgoing president of the Norwegian Students and Academics International Assistance Fund and a former member of the Global, Global Student Forum Steering Committee. Originally from Honduras, he, he has uh, previously served as deputy leader of the National Law Students Association and spokesman for the Honduran student movement. He holds a master's de degree in public administration from the University of Bergen and cur currently see, serves as policy advisor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Dr. Uloa, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Jesse. Um, so like it was already mentioned, today I'll try to bring in some perspective on the youth or student side when it relates to academic freedom. Uh, as a former representative of the global umbrella for student unions, but also as an outgoing president of uh, SAI, the Norwegian Students and Academics International Assistance Fund, which is an organization that in the last years has had a special focus on students' activist role as human rights defenders and how this connects to academic freedom. So there's two main points I want to touch upon. Uh, the first one is to try to uh, unwrap a little bit more uh, the fact or the reasoning behind why students have the right to academic freedom and also how this connects to their freedom uh, of association, like I mentioned, coming from an umbrella organization working with student unions. Uh, uh, freedom of association is one of the ground pillars of how students express their academic freedom. Um, and this, I'll try to frame it. If you look, the document was shared already on what academic freedom is. It's There's something that is very important for understanding students' role, and it relates to um, the right to engage with uh, a diversity of knowledge and ideas, but especially with the discourse part, and also that this discourse and this engagement from students uh, can happen within, or, but also outside of uh, the academic space, the academic research or teaching spaces. Um, and this is because uh, this principle, what it tells us then is that there is an obligation. It is very clear there that, as it was already mentioned as well, there is a need to respect, promote, and protect the academic freedom of students. But how does this look in practice? What does it mean to promote and protect the academic freedom of students? And a very important part in this is allowing for student unions and associations to fully operate without any kind of political or outside interference. Uh, and this is uh, something that we see when we look at the student movement across uh, time and also across continents. We see that this way of organizing that students have is something that has been within academia for many, many decades and across different cultures. It is a natural thing for uh, to see within academia. Uh, but the main challenge then is that this continues to be perceived sometimes as a disruption of academic activities. And then the attacks that these students are facing go unreported or underreported, reported, or sometimes are even justified by the actors engaging in this repression of student uh, unions. And as uh, it was already mentioned by Farida, uh, student unions have been claiming in the past years that there is an increasing shrinking space for their actions. And this is tightly connected with an attack on academic freedom because it is an essential part of academic freedom, that right that they have to organize themselves, to associate themselves, and to express and engage in public discourse. Uh, so activism in this sense, uh, the activities that students are doing outside of the classroom when they organize themselves and they engage in this activism needs to be understood as an exercise of precisely the right to academic freedom. And it's higher education institutions, uh, that should see this as a sign of a very vibrant, of a very well-functioning, healthy academic community when you see that students are engaging in these kind of activities. And therefore, it's also the state responsibility to provide the protection and the promotion of this kind of activism and activities from the student side. Um, and this is uh, natural, like I mentioned before. Uh, due to the role that academia has in society and the way students engage within the classrooms and, and uh, when they exercise their academic activities. Um, because we see that academia is a space for critical thinking. Therefore, students, when they are engaging in these activities, it is common for them to see beyond the university walls and engage with broader societal issues. And that's also an essential element of universities role in societies and the whole reason of universities in today's world. But still we see that there are threats, there are violations against students, there are uh, attacks against student groups, and that in part we believe is because there is a lack of recognition that students as part of the higher education community uh, are or possess the full range of human rights just as academics and scholars do when we talk about academic freedom. So. Of course, depending on the um, period where they are in their academic path, that a right can be exercised in a different manner from student to student, but they, as students, possess the full range of the right to academic freedom. Um, 
but there seems to be that continuous neglect. And uh, unfortunately, we keep on seeing that in many places, state and non-state actors keep on attacking and uh, engaging in surveillance, militarization, or threats against uh, student unions, student activists, and that is, in today's world, really undermining academic freedom, but also the autonomy of universities and of uh, the autonomy that student unions and student activists have. And why is this important, you might be wondering. So if we understand that student activism is an essential pillar of academia, then we also need to put academia as an essential pillar for democracy and for governance building, like Jesse mentioned before. And that is something that we, sometimes it seems that we forget about it and we are not really recognizing that academic freedom is an essential element for our democratic societies in today's world. And we have seen through research, this is um, the last point I wanna highlight because hopefully afterwards we get a chance to talk about what can we do or what's useful to, to, to protect academic freedom. And is that what we have seen in recent research that looks into student activism is that attacks against student unions, attacks against student activists or uh, efforts to undermine um, students' capacity to organize themselves and engage in public discourse is usually one of the earliest trends in countries uh, that are going towards autocratization. So if we pay attention to how academic freedom is an essential pillar of democracy, and within that academic freedom, we monitor the way student uh, organizations are engaging and are being threatened or not, we can really develop early signals or early mechanisms to kind of raise the voice when we see that the foundations, the pillars of democracy are under stress and maybe we are heading towards autocratization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hector. It's great. Um, Okay, so we have, uh, I'd say, about 10 minutes for uh, questions, interventions. Um, we welcome any, uh, if, you, if you have any questions and you're participating online, please feel free to send them in the chat. Um, of course, we welcome any state interventions uh, at this time. Um, and if not, I have some questions that I'd like to ask the panelists, but I will, I will cede the floor to any states uh, that would like to comment or question first. Not seeing anything so far. Oh, oh, sorry. Farida was raising her hand. Oh, Farida was raising her hand. I apologize. If you allow me. So I just saw in the chat there was a question about whether there was information being gathered um, regarding the uh, uh, the slaps, the um, abusive lawsuit against academics and researchers uh, that was uh, by someone from the Human Rights Center of the Ghent University um, and the Coalition Against Slaps in Europe. I just want to say I don't know how much information is being gathered about this, but as uh, the Special Rapporteur on Education, I would encourage you and anyone who has information such as these uh, abusive lawsuits to really uh, gather the information and share it with us so that we have the information at least and can subsequently see how to take it up more formally. You do need the documentation in order to shed light on any of these issues. I, I, I would second that. Um, and, you know, slap lawsuits in particular are very, the, the documentation can be very, can be very difficult. Um, identifying a lawsuit as frivolous, uh, uh, can be very challenging from a monitoring standpoint. Um, so the more information that we are provided, uh, the better able we are to kind of understand the global picture and uh, and respond. Um, thank you, Special Rapporteur Shahid, for, the, for that. Um, I see uh, a request for an intervention here. Yes, but I don't know if I may. I'm just a, a silly journalist accredited by accident to the United Nations, so I don't know if I may. I don't see why not. Okay. I wonder if we are not here discussing two different things between, as often, the obvious and the impossible, and I think it's unavoidable. For the obvious, who would say that killing professors jailing students, silencing opinions is a good thing. And 
even if there is a consensus that it is a bad thing, Erdogan and other people will not stop after being re-elected to do it. And on the other extreme, in democratic society, scholars have become a lobby. Some speak of the pouvoir intellectuel. In 1968, rightly or wrongly, student association wanted to overrun the republic. They said it straight on. So this is also an issue, but it's a much more embarrassing issue. So we don't we prefer to address the easy issue, which will not find any solution, and always avoid the difficult issue. Would any of our panelists like to respond? Uh, if not, I have uh, a response that I can provide. No problem. Okay. Well, I, I will just note that, um, yes, of course, it is when, when extreme acts of violence are perpetrated against scholars, students, et cetera, or jailings or other, other types of very obvious attacks, um, everyone can agree that they're bad. What I think the, 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 the thing that we have yet to really reckon with as a, as a, as a world, as a human rights community, um, is a recognition of the underlying motivation, which is to silence the higher education space. It's not just about violating that one person's right rights or harming that one person. Um, it is meant to send a message to the entire space. Um, and our human rights mechanisms, our practical responses to those, to those types of attacks really have, uh, have yet to, to meet the challenge. And that's one of the things that we're doing here today. Um, so I will... Um, I, okay, but fair enough. I think uh, uh, Professor Mansisidor has a, an intervention. Okay, perhaps uh, as a, a reaction of this very humble uh, question made by the silly journalist, perhaps I can uh, provide an, uh, an answer as a silly uh, independent expert. Um, first, it's always uh, true that uh, just uh, a piece of paper is not going to, 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 to stop uh, uh, the, the, the horrendous um, um, the facts by, by, by those uh, uh, people, as you, you, you mentioned. But I'm not uh, sure, because uh, the, the, this um, the document, on this instru legal instrument we are uh, considering, are an additional instrument people have to defend, first to know, and second to defend their, their, their uh, rights. And uh, even uh, those uh, instruments are an additional uh, tool for the better uh, the functioning or the better uh, um, work of their uh, existing uh, the, um, instrument or existing uh, uh, institutions as ours, for example, as the, 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 the Committee on Economic Social and Cultural Rights, where, uh, where uh, people of uh, the victims of, uh, of the violation of human rights can uh, present their, uh, their, their cases. So, uh, I think that this is uh, very uh, important to say, especially after the pandemic, with, uh, when, uh, when uh, all of us realized once and again, but uh, this was a very special moment when uh, we realized that uh, scholars and uh, science, science is in our society more important than ever. Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to ask a question. Oh. Yeah. Special rapporteur Shahid, I apologize. <laughs> you don't see me. That's all right. Please. I just want to say very uh, quickly, uh, Miguel has given some answers. I don't think the question, of course, as the journalist knows perfectly well, was silly. Um, but the thing is that I think we still have to make uh, it's a slow process as we move forward. And if we believe in democratic spaces, then that space for thinking differently, even if we don't like that opinion, um, must be there in terms of education. And so I, I still think 
the manner in which you express that, of course, there may be limitations. We're not talking about that here, but, the, but we have to look at what is absolutely necessary. And I think the principles and the document do talk uh, and the uh, special rapporteurs uh, on uh, freedom of opinion and expression has given some outline uh, in terms of possible limitations. It's a difficult subject, but I think we still have to uphold the right of everyone to academic uh, freedom to be able to think differently and to express that differently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd actually like to raise one last question, um, really for the panel, although um, it was crafted with uh, the special rapporteur in mind. Um, what would be your wish list of practical tools that you would help that would help you advise states on academic freedom would it, would it include formal guidance to be used in the context of country visits partnerships with state missions and civil society formalized partnerships with other mandate holders um, i'm sure i'm missing many many uh things so i'd, I'd love to hear um you know a response to that if you could and, and obviously i would welcome interventions from anybody on the panel, but maybe we could start with the, the special rapporteur. Um, thank you. So as you know, the, we have very limited capacity in terms of human resources. So we're always struggling. Any kind of information is therefore very welcome. We're looking at two or three things. We are trying to also work with other special, uh, uh, the special rapporteurs or other mandate holders that would have an overlap. Um, but I think we do have country visits, and that's not just the special rapporteur in education, of course. But that kind of issue would could be taken up by the uh, uh, freedom of opinion and expression mandate. It could be uh, also guidelines, um, as I think Mikael would be better able to respond. But when you have the committees who are reviewing um, activities, and that would include not just the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights uh, Committee, but the CEDA Committee, the Child Rights Committee, many committees can take up those issues. And if there are guidelines of what reporting should look like, that's a different thing, right? So you're asking for the reporting to reflect, for instance, academic freedom and so that it can be taken up. So I think there's a host of different things that could be done, but my immediate thing is um, I will probably uh, possibly be in a better position once we have started the research on academic freedom for the report that will be presented next year. So any uh, ideas in terms of guidance, et cetera, so that we can make the recommendations. And of course, it has to be a consensus building on what are the uh, guide uh, posts for this. But the more people who say the same thing, the further advanced we are. Thank you. Sure. Very briefly. I'll be very brief. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk about the, the documentation part. Uh, it was mentioned here, the slabs, for example, and in a recent report by Cy, there was a lot of talk about Loffer and how that enables then these slabs to actually be efficient in this uh, non-democratic uh, space or even democratic spaces. Um, so it's about how can we really document these attacks, but for people to recognize that these documentation efforts, these monitoring efforts are falling within the human rights framework and it's not something additional or outside of that framework. And I just wanted to mention, for example, the Free to Think report from Scholars at Risk is a very good uh, starting point. Also, the Education Under Attack from the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, and then the Activism Under Attack report now by SAI, which are tools that are documenting some of these violations against academic freedom, but we need a recognition so we need this to be recognized as part of the human rights framework and for states to really uh, acknowledge that this is part of their duties to protect and promote these rights. And then we can move towards an adaptation. So recently in a talk in the Council of Europe, that's what they were talking about. It was like we need the recognition first of the right to academic freedom before we move towards an adaptation of all the existing instruments to really report on it systematically and uh, work efficiently to promote this right. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, so we have reached uh, close to the end of the meeting. Um, and uh, to close us out, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Uruguayan Ambassador Alvaro Morzinger Pagani. Uh, Ambassador Morzinger Pagani serves as the permanent representative of Uruguay, the UN Office at Geneva. 
Prior to his appointment, he has served in a number of roles, uh, including as advisor on international policy to the president of Uruguay, director of institutional affairs at Uruguay's mission, mission of foreign affairs, as Uruguay's ambassador to the Netherlands and as permanent representative of Uruguay to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. He's also served as vice president of the Assembly of State Parties uh, of the International Criminal Court, as director of the Diplomatic Academy of Uruguay's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was Uruguay's ambassador to Canada from 2003 to 2008. Okay. And <laughs> should, we, should, I, should I stop? Yeah, uh, uh, please, please, the floor is yours, <laughs> Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Levine. Uh, I prepared a speech, uh, a closing remarks, but uh, I'm going to change because this is a very, I'm oh, sorry. I, I prepared some words for the closing remarks, but I really have to say I'm very impressed by, by the discussion that we have today. Uh, because in, in our academic culture, uh, academic freedom is, is part of our daily life. And uh, so I'm, and I think that kind of event uh, as a diplomat based in Geneva allows us to get conscious of the importance of this uh, item in the work of the Human Rights Council and, and the announcement of the special reporter that she's going to prepare a next year report about the subjects is, is very important to um, uh, show the, the, the essential part because many, many um, speakers would, uh, said about something about critical thinking. And in, in for us, it's is is essential part of of developing. If you don't have critical thinking in in the world that changes so fast, we cannot we cannot confront the the challenge of the future as a society. So for, for us, it's it's not only the to protect as you said, to say to protect the the right of a career is to protect the national interest the, to be developed in the case of developing countries, or in the case of developing countries, is to preserve the 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 pattern that uh, that we right today. So it's uh, I think is is this uh, subject have many dimensions, and uh, economic and and uh, juridical dimension, and is it. It's in our interest, in the interest of the of the council to to work, and I think is if uh, I'm sure that the the next year report will will um, cause an impact in, in our work, and and we're willing to to have to to introduce and and, and to develop, develop this concept in the in the in the work of the Human Rights Council. So, quant count of your way, and in case also, also in, in, in Latin American affairs, we have several conventions regarding this issue. Some countries in the system could adopt the automatic convention in, in, in the national law. Others need certain procedures through Parliament, but and then we have declaration, Lima declarations, and some important ones. So, as, but if we can get something in the Human Rights Council, which facilitate the, to introduce the council or to preserve in some countries the, the idea of economic freedom, uh, econom academic freedom in, in the education system. So, thank you very much, and, and for very useful participation, and come to Uruguay uh, to respond for that kind of event in the future. Thank you. It was absolutely our honor. And thank you so much for your sponsorship and your partnership. Um, we will close out the meeting, but I would just note at the end, um, this meeting really is about um, building and establishing uh, partnerships and moving toward more practical work. I see uh, at least 14 states represented in the room. 
I'd be delighted to talk to any of you after this meeting. We have the room for a few more minutes, I believe. Um, I'd be delighted to hear from anyone online. You would be delighted to hear from anyone online. Um, we are looking forward to your engagement with the process of developing uh, further the principles of implementation and work arising from that. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.